I'm both Adams. Um, some of you may know me. Uh, I'm now the CTO and co-founder of Edgeflow. Before that, I worked at Google for over 10 years, where I was the Bazel TL. Uh, and this is the talk that I've been wanting to do for about 10 years now. Um, now, I, I don't know exactly how it's going to go. <laughs> um, this is, I, I, I basically spent the last week in my basement trying to come up with something to talk about for this talk. Um, let's see how it goes. Um, I'm a little bit nervous, but um, I hope you're a great audience, so we'll get there. All right, so what is this talk about? Um, I want to talk about the user experience of Bazel. And so what does user experience mean? Uh, and I forgot to add that here. Sorry about that. So I, want, I was in a plane while I was doing the, the slides, and I had limited ability to look up things. So sorry about that. So the user experience is, is sort of what does the user experience? What, what do they do? How do they interact with a tool in this case? Um, you know, what do they need to do? What problems do they have? How does it frustrate them? All of that. Um, and now, of course, you know, the obvious question is, or, or I think we want a better user experience. All right. And now the question is why? So we want less frustration, right? We want users, we want everyone who uses Bazel to have a good time, right? To be able to do what they need to do and for the tool to get out of the way. Uh, when I was at Google, the, we had like this, this tagline. My tagline was make Bazel invisible, right? We don't want users to have to worry about it. We also ideally, I, I think, you know, I, I would like more users of Bazel. I think Bazel is cool. Um, of course, it doesn't, it doesn't solve every use case today. Um, but it would be great if, if more users could use it and if it was easy for users to start using. And then, of course, when users use the tool, we want them to not waste a lot of time on problems, on friction that the tool itself generates. We want them to, to go beyond the tool and solve the problems that they actually want to solve and make progress and, and write Roku OS or whatever. Um, and then, of course, we want less boom. Um, and um, the, some of you may know that SpaceX has uh, publicly said that they're using Bazel. And so, of course, we don't want a bad user experience in Bazel to cause rockets to explode. I don't know if that ever happened. Um, but also, I want, absolutely wanted to have a picture in my talk. Uh, the rest of this talk, unfortunately, is going to be very, very text heavy. So here's your picture. Um, more about this talk, um, sort of what, I'm, what am I aiming for? I want to talk about the UX but I don't have the answers. Um, I think I have some answers, and I think I can provide some insight into what's going on, but there are gonna be more questions in this talk than answers. And I hope what you're taking away from this is that, that UX is interesting, that it's important, um, and hopefully you will also take away some things that you can do yourself to improve your basal user experience. User experience is a big topic. I, even, even if we just look at Bazel, it's already a big topic. So I have two parts to this talk. The first one is flags. And I don't, I'm not going to go into details about like which flags to use or what they mean exactly, but I'm going to look at the concept of flags and Bazel and how to organize it. We'll get to that. And then the second topic I really want to talk about is terminal output, output from Bazel. So what does Bazel print? in your terminal, and is that a good user experience? Is there, you know, what do we want to achieve there? What can we possibly do better there? All right, part one. Um, let's start with flags. So when, when you think about how you interact with Bazel, and I mean, this isn't how everyone sees Bazel, right? Some people wrap Bazel in make or do something else interesting, right? Some people wrap Bazel with a graphical UI. Uh, there is a company in Germany that does that. Of course, there is also like a graphical user interface that you can connect to Bazel, right? 
there is like a, a build UI interface that you can connect. And they're going to talk. We're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the like raw, hardcore terminal experience. OK, so how do you interact with Bazel in this case? Right, You run Bazel, you run Bazel build, output filter equals none, my target. And then it starts doing things, and it prints something, and at some point, it's done. All right, and you have your binary. So when we look at this command line, there are a couple of parts here. Um, and I'm, again, I have, to, I have to break it down. It's a big problem. I'm only going to look at the build command. Uh, I'm not going to look at query, or a query, or C query, or, or fetch, or whatever. I'm only going to look at the build command, because at least in my experience, it's the most common command that I'm running. All right, so what's the structure of the build command? Uh, there is Bazel. Then you have some startup flags. Oh, flags, OK. Then you have a command, right? In this case, we're going to focus on build. Then you have flags for the command itself. Then you have targets. Um, and then Bazel actually allows you to also have some arguments, maybe. Uh, maybe not on the build command, but on the run command. Anyway, so this is sort of the general structure of the Bazel command. And so there are a couple of parts here and a couple of questions we might have. Uh, why do we have startup flags? How are they different from, from command flags? What commands are there in the first place? I mentioned a couple, but how do you know? How do you know, you know where are they coming from? What are they doing? What are the flags and what are they doing? What's the effect if I, if I set the flag? What is the effect of output filter equals none? Um, what is a target, uh, right? What targets are there, right? As, as a user, you have these questions and you don't always necessarily, you know, verbalize these questions, but they are sort of implicit in your workflow. In order to use Bazel, you need to give it a command line. In order to give it a command line, you need to at least have some idea of some of these concepts. Now, what we're going to do today is to dig, dive deep into the flags. Um, so let's take a look, right? There is a help command, and help command can give you the flags output. I need a little bit more space here because the output isn't, isn't the chart. Um, all right, there is a release version number. Then we have some categories. We have some flags, more flags, even more flags, more categories. Ooh, flags. Flags, flags. This is the short version of the output. <laughs> Almost there. Oh, oh, incompatible flags. What do they do? So one of the first things, I don't, you know, we, we talk about flags often in the very abstract, but one of the things that we need to do, in my opinion, is to actually take a hard look at, at what's there. Um, and so that's why I decided to add the entire list of flags here that we get an idea of what the problem looks like. There are, in 6.2.0, which I think is the latest official release, is 581 flags. Um, in 7.0.0 pre, something, something, something that we're using internally, it's 618 flags. So we added at least 37 flags in, in, in 7.0. So is this a good user experience? How, how many people here have memorized all of the basal flags? <laughs> right? How, how many, you know, we can, we can have the discussion that maybe fewer flags would be better, but, but how many flags would be good? Do we have a number? Like, what about 20, 40? What about 100? Is that okay? And that's not really the question I want to answer here. Um, but if we want to make the user experience better, would it be better to have fewer flags? Probably yes. Um, but what flags could we remove? Where are these flags coming from? What is the, what is the reason for these flags to exist? And so unfortunately, we have to go, at least in my opinion, again, right? I'm, 
I'm a very like bottoms up person. We have to go through all the flags to figure out what's going on here. And so I spent last week in my basement going through all the 581 flags to figure out what's going on. And this talk is about what I found out. So we can't talk about every flag individually, right? That would take hours. So fortunately, I'm not going to do that. Um, what we have to do is we have to group the flags, right? There are flags that are similar to each other. There are flags that are very different. Some flags have certain kind of uses in certain scenarios, but not in others. And so maybe we can come up with some way of grouping the flag, some, of, some kind of categories. Uh, and we already saw in the Bezos output, Bezos does have categories. All right, let's, let's take a look at those. Unfortunately, I had to uh, make the font smaller to fit it up the slide. Um, so there is options that appear before the command and are parsed by the client. So that sounds like startup flags. But when you look at Bezos Help, you'll find there is also a Bezos Help startup options command, which prints startup flags. And it turns out the startup flags that it prints are not the same as in this list. Oops. Um, but I don't want to talk about startup flags. I, it's an interesting topic all in itself. Uh, and there is a question of, should there be startup flags at all? You know, this is a concept that makes Bezos more difficult to use. Um, we have options that control build execution. OK, what does that mean? I don't know, actually, right? The problem with these categories is, or one of the problems is there isn't a clear definition for what they mean. Um, and so if you look at the list, you can sort of squint and say, yeah, I can see how that makes sense. But then sometimes you, you see flags that are like completely out of place. And so I, I think we need to ask the question, what are good categories and how do we define them? And how do we document them so that as we add more flags in the future, maybe um, we can put them in the right categories in a, in a way that makes sense. Unfortunately, if you look at the existing flags, you'll sometimes find, well, people put them in the wrong category. And the question is why? And I think the answer is the, the categories aren't well defined. And so one of the things I want to do today is define good categories. And so I thought about what does it mean? What is a good categorization? So there needs to be a reasonable number of categories, right? If we have too many categories, it's really hard to keep an overview of what's going on, right? If you have to scan through 50 categories in order to find one, maybe not that useful, right? The individual categories get very small and you have a lot of them. But if you have too few categories, then they get very broad, right? You have a category of all the flags. That's not really helpful, right? What we want to do is we want to try to quickly find the relevant flags in the scenario that you're you're looking at. And of course, we and I said this before, we really, we need a crisp definition. It needs to be clear what the categories mean. And I think that's an area where we can make an improvement at at the very least. Uh, so here are some of the examples from the existing categories. Uh, options that control build execution is mostly flags that configure local sandbox, local Docker, and dynamic execution. But there are some outliers. There is check up to date in there, which doesn't seem quite related. Or maybe it does. There is experimental UI max standard out error bytes, which seems completely unrelated. Um, then we have experimental remote build source manifests, which kind of seems related, but maybe not in the way that we expect. Uh, another is like options that configure the tool chain, options that control the output of the command. All right, well, what is output in Bezos' case? Right, there is terminal output. Is that what it means? There are like binaries and packages that are output as part of the build. Is that what it means? Uh, here we have a mix of different things. We have like a, a proto library flag, and then we have run validations, which is like 
doesn't have any, really any depth. What does it have to do with Proto Library? All right. So I took a shot. I spent a few hours to come up with a new set of categories. Um, and I have a spreadsheet. I went through every single flag in Basil Bill. And in the spreadsheet, I annotated everything. There is a link to the spreadsheet at the end of the talk. So if this seems useful to you, you can look it up and you can look at the individual categories and, and what flags are category, categorized are. All right. So I have come up with seven categories. And you might be surprised because there are only six on the slide because I couldn't fit the seventh one. But the seventh is also very simple. The seventh category is the no op flags. They're actually flags in Basel that don't do anything. And so I put them into a no op category. Why are they in there? For the most part, they're in there because the Basel team used them as a, for, for migration, right? Initially, the state of the world was like this. And they thought it would be better if the state of the world was like that. And so they add a flag, and then they switch the flag on, right? And they, they typically want to do that independently of, of a release, because if you put everything into release, the release breaks someone, you can't release, right? And so a, a lot of this is flag-based rollouts. And there is actually a category for that. Category four is the migration flags. They are intended for the controlled rollout of semantic changes to Basel or its rules, such as changes to the build language itself, exported APIs, root semantics. These are intended to be temporary. All right, now that everyone had a look at the categories, I'm actually going into a little bit more detail. Um, let's see first that the look at the numbers. Um, debug flags, 81. Input flags, 83. Rules flags, a lot. Actually, like a third of the flags are rules related in some way. Uh, migration flags, there are quite a number of migration flags. Uh, strategy flags, meta flags, and a bunch of not flags. All right. So I, I want to go through the categories um, and I want to explain what they mean. I hope this is useful to you, um, but this might be a little bit lengthy. So Stop me if it's getting too boring. Debug flags. So I call them debug. They change how Basel displays or emits information about what is happening during the build. This may be through the command line interface. It may be through upload to a remote service or by writing additional, typically local output files. Right. This is for you to debug what's happening inside of a Basel build. These flags should have minimal performance impact. But of course, if you add outputs to a build, it can always make it slower. That is like an obvious thing that can happen. Um, and I, on top of the categories, I have subcategories. So when I, when I looked at all the flags, I sort of started to slowly add them into, into groups. And then I discovered even within the groups, there are subgroups of, of things that, that sort of belong together. So I have a CLI subgroup that are flags that affect the terminal output. Um, we have a build event protocol group subgroup, which are flags to um, configure the upload to a remote UI service that you can then open in your browser. I took the easy way out here and added another category, which is a bunch of random flags that sort of related to debugging, but don't really have a clear other category. This is the only exception I have, and I really hate this about the existing categories in Basel. There are like two categories, like missed flags. OK. What do I do with that? I, like, do I scan through all the flags? No. OK. Pro and then, then we have another subcategory of profiling. Uh, flags that affect profiling outputs. Uh, Basil has quite a bit of profiling infrastructure. It can generate like a JSON profile, uh, which you can load into Chrome or other tools to, to look at exact, exactly what's going on through, during a build. And you can also profile Starlog code that runs as part of the code. Input flags. All right, input flags significantly change how Basil sees the world, what the workspace layout looks like, what is considered source code, what targets are built, and what platforms they are built for. And I decided to separate this 
from language specific flags. So to some extent, language specific flags also change how Bezos sees the world or how it runs things. But I wanted to have this at a, se a separate category, right? When we look at, at language specific flags, one important thing comes up again and again, which is not everyone uses every language, <laughs> obviously, right? And so if we have categories that mix language flags together, you end up having to look through all of the JavaScript flags or all of the C++ flags in order to find this, the one Java flag that you're actually looking for, right? And so I think it makes a lot of sense. And this is how I've been personally thinking about these flags. And this is also how the Bazel source code works, right? If you look at the Bazel source code, there are these options classes and there is actually a separate option class for every language that is has a built-in rules in Bazel, right? And so it makes a lot of sense to, to group these flags together. Now, the subcategories are a bit, little bit lengthy, um, and there are some interesting things in here. Um, and one of the reasons I want to go through this is because you, you, as a Bazel user, you may not realize that these features exist, right? There are features that are sometimes like deeply hidden inside of the flags, but they are really powerful. Um, and so one set of flags are aspects-related flags. Aspects are uh, things that allow you to attach additional actions to your build in different places. You can attach to specific rules. You can attach to specific actions. Um, what is it you good for? Uh, one of the main use cases is static analysis. Uh, you can attach to all the C++ compiled actions and look at all the source code and then run stuff on top of that. Um, and one of the big advantages of using aspects for this is Bazel will also parallelize all your aspects work, right? If you do this as a separate tool, which doesn't understand build files and which doesn't integrate with the build system, those tools are often, you know, either they have to invent their own like distributed parallel execution or they run serially, serially on your local machine, uh, which of course you can do, uh, but can be slow. Then we have coverage flags. And this is an interesting sort of weird case, right? There is a coverage command in Bazel, and there are coverage flags. And the coverage flags are also on the built command. Surprise! Who knew that? Who knew that the coverage flags were in the build command? Right? This means that when you when you configure coverage, you can actually do that all the time. Um, but the actual coverage collection is only enabled when you run the coverage command. You can actually enable coverage on the build command as well, but let's not talk about that. We have flags to support flag management. Um, right, when you, when you end up with almost 600 flags, or at this point over 600 flags, of course, you know, you need to manage how you're, you're, you're doing your, your, your flags, uh, right? And in, in many builds today, right, uh, we see people having 10, 20, 30 flags enabled, and they have different configs to enable different sets of flags. And this is a really powerful mechanism if you have different use cases, uh, right? And I just looked at stuff from, from oh, the nice frog set aspect who have some proposed configs. So one of the configs is for debugging, right? So if you need to debug, you, you pass dash dash config equals debug to your Bazel command, and it will give you more output to, to figure out what's going on. Uh, then we have platform flags. These control sort of what are you building for, what you're building on. Um, what you're building on isn't necessarily your local machine, right? Once you add remote execution to the mix, and Bazel was designed with remote execution in mind basically from the beginning at Google, um, you can run Bazel on a Linux machine but actually run everything else on a Mac and your, your binaries are Mac, Mac outputs. Uh, you can do cross build, you can, sorry, cross platform, you can do multi platform builds, at least in theory. Uh, I spent a couple of hours going through the platform flags to figure out exactly how they worked and how our own flags would be adjusted. Um, and so having this category, I think, makes a lot of sense, right? If, you, if, you, if this is something where you might want to spend some time on, um, at some point, not necessarily every time you run and build, but occasionally you want to look at these platform flags and see, 
what's the current state and it, are we actually using using data in in the way that's intended to be used um, there is a big migration going on there unfortunately originally Bazel didn't have a concept of platforms and so every language invented its own concept of a platform right there is a c++ compiler and you can configure that to generate output for arm 64 and then you have the java the java tool chain which the primary thing is you have like different versions java 7 java 9 java whatever um, right and all of these were completely separate and if you wanted to configure a build to target arm 64 it's not enough to set a single sort of platform but now you have to manage all of the languages in your build at the same time and so at some point the basal team decided um, to add a platform abstraction where we have a common concept of a platform and that platform consists of tool chains for different languages and you only need a single platform flag to set all of the tool chains at the same time so you can make sure that you get a consistent view across all the languages in your repository now you personally may only have a single language but google certainly does it. google has like every language i pick one it has it right all right um Repositories, uh, repository flags, control or modify which additional remote resources are pulled into a build. This could be source code, this could be binary files. Uh, you know, often they are pulled from a, a remote system. They could be pulled from Maven, they could be pulled from uh, Python, pip, whatever it's called, thingy. Um, then we have, I have a subcategory I call selection. And I think this is again a very interesting one that you might want to take a look at at some point. These affect how top level targets are selected. So when you say Bazel build X, Bazel will look at X and then build X. It will also build everything that's necessary for X. And so, but if you if X depends on Y, right, Y could have like a hundred different actions that generate like different outputs. For example, you have a Java binary and it depends on a proto library. You only want to build the Java parts of the proto library because only those are needed for your top level binary. And so if you build if you build that Java binary, you only get the Java parts, right? And so the concept of top level outputs is very important in Bazel because it determines what parts of your tree are actually built. Um, and there are a couple of really interesting flags in there that could help you in a variety of cases. These are flags. All right, I'll get to that. Um, we have semantic flags that are like very low level flags, like consistency checks, visibility, constraints, test only. I recommend don't touch them. There are some rare cases where you have like a legacy repository and you absolutely can't enable visibility checks. Okay, Google had to go through that transition at some point as well. The, the visibility rules didn't exist at the beginning. When I joined Google, right? Uh, and we invented those, and then we had to migrate a giant repository to visibility. And so these are flags that can help with that rollout. But in general, I recommend not to use them because everything should be declared in the right way. Um, and so this is a category that you typically don't need to look at. Unless you have a really, very really special use case, this is one thing that you probably don't need to look at. Right? Again, this is if we define the categories in the right way, that's exactly what we want to have. We want to have categories that we don't need to look at. Um, we have stamping flags. Um, these are flags that control and configure how stamping information is obtained and used. Stamping is the process of putting some information about the build into your binaries. Now, this is especially useful when you do a release build. You want to put a release number into your binary. Excellent. Excellent use case. Now, what you might not want to do is to have stamping enabled all the time, because that can be very expensive. For example, if you put the current timestamp into your binaries, and then some time passes, like, I don't know, a millisecond, Basil will have to rebuild the binary in order to, to update the timestamp. Uh, now, there is a caveat there. This only controls stamping as it's visible to Basil. There are some people who build their own stamping infrastructure if it's opaque to Bazel and Bazel doesn't know. All right, what do we have? We have a couple, I sorry, another shortcut I took. We have a couple of flags for like 
a variety of static analysis things in Bazel, which for this talk I put into a single category in the in the uh, spreadsheets. These are actually separate categories. Most of these are deprecated in in favor of aspects, so you may not have to look at them at this point. Again, good tests. Uh, these are flags that control test selection and caching. This is again useful if you have a test that isn't working. Um, you know, for whatever reason. Um, you can use these flags to really narrow down what's going on. For example, um, let's say you have to debug a test that takes 10 minutes to run. Well, that's annoying. Every time you make a change, you rerun the test, takes 10 minutes, right? But let's say the test is actually consists of a thousand individual test cases. There is a flag in here which allows you to select an individual test case, and maybe that takes only 20 seconds to run. And now you've you've cut down your your change and rerun loop from from ten minutes to twenty seconds, right? Again, these are flags that I personally use every day. Rules flags, rules flags also significantly change basic behavior, similar to input flags. However, these flags are language specific. In most cases, the user won't need to set such a flag unless they also use the corresponding affected built in rules. Now, changing these flags may incur cache misses. So if you have caching enabled, this caching, remote caching, whatever, these flags can cause the full rebuild of your software. Um, again, they're like individual languages, some flags, you know, if flags are language specific, then maybe only that language will be rebuilt. So you have like a, I don't know, a C++ a giant C++ application with a tiny bit of Python. You change the Python flags, you know, you're fine, probably. Um, but if it's the other way around, you change the C++ flag, everything gets rebuilt. So what you want to do is it's it's very strongly recommended to put these flags into your Bazel RC and to manage them with the flag management flags. So there you go. Um, the other important thing here is that every change to these flags creates sort of a separate cache silo uh, where two users that have different flags set or flags set to different values will get completely separate caches effectively. In most cases, not always the case, but in most cases. And so you really want to tightly control so which of these configurations you have in your builds and which you allow in your base RC. Um, there are always exceptions. There is no rule without exceptions. Sometimes someone just has to rebuild this binary with per file C odds. Okay, go for it. Subcategories in this case exist for basically all the built in rules. Um, I found categories Android, Apple. Apple is a little bit special because there are a lot of Mac specific stuff in there. Um, C file set. File set doesn't exist in Bazel, Google only, so you don't need to look at that. Don't complain about file set being Google only. This is a good thing. <laughs> you definitely don't want to use file set. File set predates uh, the invention of Bazel and is much more weird than anything you want to look at. You have to trust me on that. J2 Objective C, there are actually J2 Objective C rules in Bazel, Java, Objective C, Protobuf, Python Shell, and Swift. Then we have migration flags, and I talked about that a little bit before. They're intended for the controlled rollout of semantic changes. These are typically used if a change to Bazel is subtle and it's difficult to tell a priori whether it is safe or not, and therefore requires a rollout period. The way the Bazel team works is they make changes to Bazel all the time, right? They have like a lot of people, they make changes all the time, they run those changes against all of Google's code. If it breaks something, the change is rolled back, right? So if you have something that requires multiple steps to roll out, you need to change something in a build file, you need to change something maybe in a source file and whatnot, they have to use flags. So you add the flag to Bazel, the new Bazel release comes out, someone at Google goes through there, you know, with a comb through their internal repository to figure out all of this, the places where stuff breaks fixes them ideally so that it works with both with and without the flag, and then flips the flag. Uh, due to the temporary nature of these flags, it is strongly recommended. Oh, sorry, there are P 
piece missing here. Advanced users can use these flags to opt in to migration changes early or opt out if they need to upgrade to a basal release that has switched to default. Now, of course, these are temporary, so I strongly recommend to upgrade as soon as you can if you opt out of a migration change. And this is, again, a really important thing in terms of categories, right? If the Bazel team tells you this is intended to be a migration flag, at least you have some idea sort of of the expected protocol around what's happening with these flags, right? And if this flag doesn't work with your code base, ideally, you know, there are two options. Well, there are like multiple options you have, of course, every time you have multiple options. but. Do notify the Bazel team if you can't roll it out, if it breaks something in your repository. Um, I think no one from the Bazel team is here, so they can't disagree with that. Excellent. Um, or, of course, upgrade, right? These migration flags are intended to upgrade, and so they're intended to flip at some point. Now, I have to add at this point that um, while going through the list of flags, I found some flags that date back to 2018 and haven't been flipped yet. Um, you can opt in or not. This is, but there is a risk that in some cases, the Basel team might decide to go back on that flag and decide not to do the migration at all or delay it indefinitely. There's no, at this point, there's no SLA on like turnaround time on when flags are going to be flipped or not. There are also bugs in the Basel bug tracker where you can see this is going to be flipped in 2.0. Uh, which version are we on again? Then I have strategy flags. I think this is a really interesting group. These are flags that are intended to not affect what you're building or how you build what you're building. They're, they're intended to not change the sort of the binary output of your, of your actions. What they do is they tell Bazel how to build it, right? This could be enabling and configuring various caches in Bazel. This could be different local strategies for, for local execution. It could be remote execution. There are some repositories flags that are sort of advisory or uh, sort of policy related where I want to have this policy for remote repositories, um, but they shouldn't actually change what the output of the Bazel build is. Um, so these flags should be semantically neutral, uh, so should result in bit identical outputs. Now, there are some cases where we have rule specific flags that also are sort of neutral, in which case I put them into the rules category instead. Right, so this isn't going to be enough. If you, if there is something rule specific, you may need into that look into that category. Um, that's just how it goes. Um, there are also some exceptions where these can affect the, the sort of the bit output of your actions, but this should be very rare. And again, I have subcategories: um, dynamic execution. If you haven't heard about dynamic execution yet. Dynamic execution combines local and remote execution and tries to maximize the performance of the build given the available local and remote resources. And I think it's a really cool concept, but it's also not entirely straightforward, right? I said earlier, right, if you use remote execution, you could run a Mac build from a Linux machine, in which case, you know, your Mac binaries aren't going to work when you try to run them locally. So, if, if that's the case, you do need to be a little bit careful with like cross-platform or multi-platform bits. Um, then I have a set of flags that I call exec, not quite the right name, um, which tell Bazel which strategy to use for which action, right? Ooh. Okay. Uh, what strategies are there you can you can execute actions locally you can sandbox them locally you can run them remotely there is a worker strategy which is something you know which keeps additional state to make things faster um, or dynamic so that's another thing that you can pick there and so you can say right let's say you have a migration again migration 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 is a big topic um, you, you want to add remote execution to your build. 
and it turns out your sorry JavaScript rules don't work remotely, then you can tell Basil, this is no longer the case. We've been working with the community to uh, to help fix that, and other people have fixed that. I haven't actually personally done very much on that. Um, but you can tell Basil, so all of the JavaScript actions, they continue to run locally, but I can move all of the Java and C++ stuff remotely. Or the other way around. Maybe your C++ stuff doesn't work remotely because you're using a compiler um, that is licensed, and you only have like a limited number of licenses, and you know it's tied to your local machine or something. Right, in which case you may not be able to run that remotely. Uh, right, then we also have flags to configure the various local execution execution strategies, and there are like multiple strategies, so there are again subcategories here. Um, and then we have a set of flags to enable remote execution and configure remote execution. The remote category of flags also configures local caching, which may be a little bit surprising, but from Bezos' perspective, the local disk cache is considered a remote cache because it also uses the current working directory as a cache. So when you enable the disk cache, you actually have two caches enabled, actually three, because it's also an in-memory cache. So there is a lot of caches in Bazel. Um, we have repositories flags that can configure how repositories are fetched, and then test flags. These are, again, I think very interesting. They, you can. You can configure how tests are executed, uh, including resource management and flaky test handling. And this is really interesting, especially for, for your CI, where you want to make sure, well, what do you want to achieve in your CI and what are the right flags, right? This is a category to look at when you, when you configure your CI. I have a meta category, again, not maybe ideally named. Um, these are low-level flags that affect how Bazel works internally, mostly re dealing with the sorry retention of in-memory caches and out-of-memory errors. These flags are I would generally consider unsafe for individual users. <laughs> Thank you, Louis, for that contribution. <laughs> now. <laughs> These flags I would consider unsafe for individual users. However, let's say you're working at a company and you have a large scale CI system. These flags can massively improve the performance of your at scale CI system. The problem is just if you if you set one of these flags on your like individual local user build, most likely your build is going to break either this build or the build afterwards, because Bazel doesn't try to make sure that things keep working. This, this, this is a sort of a little bit brittle, where if you, if you do it just the right way, it will work perfectly, and it will save you massive amounts of memory and CPU at scale. But they're not really designed for individual users. They're designed for managed builds. I don't have any subcategories. There are only, I think there are six flags in this category, so no subcategories. All right, so how many flags do you need? Okay, flags I have in my personal base RC. So if you look at debug CLI, these flags change what base sort of colors and sort of what messages it outputs. Um, and I have these in my personal base RC because these are sort of my preferences. I would prefer to have Test case information. Okay, that's not the right category for test. Oh, it is. Sorry. This actually, this also has some test flags. So, um, and we'll get to that in a little bit in part two. All right. Um, so this is the, the category that I recommend people look at because you know you can adjust how Bazel output stuff to your to your personal preferences. Um, then we have flags that I personally use every day. There is input selection. Um, which selects which top-level targets are executed, right? If you need to debug a build and you only want to run this one target or you want to run this subset of targets, these are really useful. Uh, there is input test, which allow you to sort of tweak exactly how tests are executed. This is really, really useful for debugging. I, I talked earlier about like 10-minute tests to 20-second tests. This is 
the category to look at if you need to debug your tests. Um, strategy test is, is sort of similar. Um, doesn't affect how the tests are built, um, but does affect a little bit how they run. Um, and then there is also the debug other category, and these can really help out if Bazel seems to be doing something weird, right? Pretty much for everything that Bazel does, there is like a corresponding log file where you can get all of the details of what, ba of what Bazel is doing. You need to debug an issue with remote execution, there is a flag for that. Gives you like a full dump of everything that Bazel did. Um, and this is just 66 flags. So if we can categorize flags like this, and we can tell people to look at these categories like that, uh, we just reduce the number of flags that people need to look at by almost a factor of 10. So I think this is useful. I'm not sure if I have the right categories, but I think that this work is useful uh, because it allows you to not look at everything. Um, and then I have a bunch of flags where, like, I look, I set them up once, right? And, and then I put something into the Bazel RC, either for everyone to use or via a config, um, right? The build event protocol for a web based UI. We happen to have one at edge load. Um, input aspects for static analysis. I sent it over once. We have static analysis for Java, for Python, for C++, and so on. Um, platforms, of course, you know, occasionally you need to look at that. Input repositories is something, depending on how much you work with third-party dependencies, this is something important to look at. This is more like this one time you really need to look at it, or you have a performance issue, you need to look at those. Um, input stamping is something to look at once. Uh, rules language is something to look at every now and then. Right, you're a really good Objective C programmer. By all means, you know every now and then take a look at rules Objective C. And then, of course, my favorite category is strategy remote. All right. So, is this helpful? What do you think? I, I've seen people nodding every now and then. Good. How do you make that rule? So, so I talked to Googlers uh, earlier this year, um, and uh, one of them said that he really wanted to work on reducing the number of flags, but he wasn't getting the buy-in needed from management, and so he couldn't really execute on that. But I think what I have here is a different proposal. Um, Reducing the number of flags is certainly useful and is something that we should do. Um, but if we can come up with these categories, to some extent, sort of, we're we're making the problem smaller, or we're making the user experience better without necessarily a huge amount of effort. All right, everyone take a deep breath. Thank you. So if you if you look at the spreadsheet that I've linked at the end of the uh, talk, um, I actually have two columns with recommendations. I have one column, recommendations for end users, set these flags, don't set those flags. Uh, uh, these are these recommendations for users are very conservative. I really only pick flags that I'm like 120% sure they're going to be fine and you're not going to run into problems. Um, this Maybe there is some more work I could do there to, to come up with a more comprehensive list of flags. Uh, this could also be shared with our friends at Aspect. They actually have a repository with recommended flags. So that might be worth looking at as well. Um, finding out which flags are in a specific Bazel version, there isn't really a good way except to run Bazel help. Um, so I, I'm you know, depending on what you're trying to do, I, I think there is something more behind that question, um, but I, I don't want to guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
do you have, I mean, do you have any uh, kind of statistics on that from the users to figure out which like, you should use or like, to figure out which you can buy or something like that? Come up from your head. So, from from Basil Team's perspective, there are there is Google, right? Basil Team is all pretty much all Googlers at this point, so they can see every flag that is used at Google. They have um, instrumentation that records every single Basil invocation at Google, uh, so they have full full visibility to everything. Um, now, outside of Google. When it comes to open source projects, um, you know most of them are open source, right? And so their their Basel RC is open, their their CI may be open. Um, so that's something where that data could be collected. I don't currently know of any automated way to collect those things. Um, and then, of course, when we come to companies proprietary with their proprietary code bases, the Basel team basically has no visibility into what's going on there. Now, I would like to change that. Um, and with that, I, I don't mean, I, don't, I want everyone to open up all their proprietary code bases. Um, but maybe we can come up with a way that allows the Basel team a limited amount of insight into what's going on inside of companies. So ideally, in a semi-automated way. I'm spitballing here. Yay. Uh, this is probably another talk. <laughs> I can do that next year. Um, but let's say the Basel team could have a file where it says, here is a like a migration flag. We'd really like to flip the default. Please, everyone, run a build on your CI with a flag flipped, maybe both ways, and give us some insight into what's happening when that flag is flipped. Is the build just going through? All the tests are passing. Perfect. right? If it not, maybe there is a way we can summarize, maybe with AI, what's happening in, in that case. Uh, and then, of course, you know, since these are companies and their proprietary code bases, most likely someone at the company will have to take a brief look at sort of the summary and say, yes, this is fine to share, or sorry, we can't share. Right. And and if we can build that and sort of come up with a protocol and automate this a little bit, I think this could be really powerful and really enable the Basel team to do a much better job at new releases, at migrations, um, and just generally flipping flag defaults and then getting rid of flags as well. Uh, this is something that, again, because I worked on the Basel team for a long time, this is something that the Basel team has discussed internally a lot, but always sort of, oh, we can't do anything. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, <laughs> I did that myself. But at this point where I'm outside of Google, I'm trying to come up with like ideas, sort of the, 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 the idea generator in my brain is starting to engage uh, for, for better or worse. And so maybe there are things we can do. There. Yes. I guess if you have a remote institution enabled, then the UI can activation service will be provided. Yes. Yes. The the one tricky bit there is some flags take targets or secrets or credentials as inputs, and you certainly don't want to automatically share them with everyone else for obvious reasons. Can you add about the fact that Google also uses centralized base RCs and that sort of doesn't help a little bit in the sense that they can just control what everyone is seeing instead of, you know, I just wanted to sort of, I don't know if you have any more background on that, like that, that so that basically Google has this centralized way of that thing. Well, I'm, I'm not sure there is a question in there. Um, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you you can't see what Basil is doing internally, but Basil is certainly using Basil RC's Google. Well, well, sorry, what Google is using internally, uh, but Google is certainly using Basil RC's very extensively to come up with well-defined as much as possible um, configs or or sets of flags um, that that they 
recommend people to use so that everyone has a good experience. And certainly also, I, I mentioned that earlier, earlier already, you, you want to not have too many of those because you end up with these silos where the cache stopped working. Okay. There, there, there is an equivalent of that. Just <laughs> um, I agree that such a flag should exist. Now, I, I don't have commit rights on the Bazel repository, so I can't make it happen myself. Um, but we could potentially work together to figure out what they would look like. And we'll actually dive into that now. Basal terminal output, part two. So let's go back to the beginning of the talk where we looked at the basal output. You run basal build and it sort of starts churning some stuff and some point it's done. And you know, there is something that happens here on the terminal. Um, and looking back, sort of the model behind that output sort of how Basil team has designed that is conceptually um, you run the build and you have a sort of history that's like scrolling back and you have a current status that could be one line or multiple lines and then you get more history output and the status sort of scrolls down or your terminal scrolls up most likely and then you end up with a final summary at the end of the build. Um, and this is this is literally how we design the basal output. Now, so I again I, I went into myself and thought about this and tried to come up with requirements for this terminal output. What do we want there? Well, we want it to be readable, right? We want to understand what is what, what does it mean? You know, there is some line of text there. Where is it coming from? Uh, we want it to be scannable. So like there is like one error in your build output, you want to be able to scroll to the right location quickly, ideally. Um, or maybe you want the error to be always visible, you know, maybe that. Uh, you want it to be scalable. Um, and sort of the range that, that I think, again, Google is a little bit weird, but even for non-Google companies, the scale that we're looking at is like, running between one and 100,000 targets, uh, 100,000 tests, 100,000 targets, 100,000 actions. And a bunch of that is happening in parallel, right? One of the benefits of Bazel is that it will parallelize across at least as many cores in your local machine. Well, it can if you let it. You don't have to. Uh, there is a flag for that. Um, or you can even go with remote execution. You can run like literally 200, 300, 500, 1,000 things in parallel. Um, and the, the, the terminal output needs to be able to handle that, uh, right? And the sort of things to think about, which may not be immediately obvious, and we've encountered them again and again in our work, sort of what about this very, very large test log file? Why would anyone write five gigabits of test logs? I mean, that's crazy, right? Um, but it happens, right? You, you have like an inner loop, you have your code, you, you know, the code is running in a test, the test has, a, the code has an inner loop, the inner loop is run 100,000 times, you print ABC from that, you, you immediately have 300 kilobytes of output. But that's really quickly, that can happen really quickly. Um, and so it's something that, that has happened and it will happen and will happen again. What do we do about that? How do we present that in the terminal output? Should we just dump everything? And we could, but it's not very useful. Um, I don't know about you, but I think my terminal has a history of 1,000 lines. Um, you know, so if it's longer than that, it, it, I can't even scroll back to that point. It's just gone. Uh, also, Another requirement is timeliness, um, right? Something doesn't work in my build. I want to know as soon as possible when it doesn't work. 
I don't want to have it run the test and wait for five minutes and then suddenly figure out, oh, it didn't work, ideally. Now, that isn't always possible. Um, and that's a sort of a trade-off we need to make. Um, and also, when we, when we design the terminal output, we also have to take into account that users are going to use the output while the build is still ongoing. In some cases, pe people even change the source files while the, while the build is ongoing, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. But uh, certainly, the output needs to be stable-ish or something. So um, let's talk about the three parts that I talked about earlier. Right? We have the history which sort of just scrolls up, just stuff. All right, what, what stuff? Um, well, one of, the, one of the restrictions that we, that we put on that is once we print it, it stays printed. This is the permanent log. You can't go back. Um, is this a good model? Um, and what do we want to show here? Well, we certainly want to show errors, but what about warnings? What about in progress actions? Uh, should they go print something into history? Should we stream the output from actions as they're running? Right? Some actions are very quick. Some actions take very long, especially tests often can take long. Um, what, what should happen with the output? What about cache actions? Right? If I run a build twice, do I want to see the same output or not? This is actually one which where I'm actually a little bit sad about. There was a flag for that, uh, which the Bazel team removed. Um, in my opinion, I'm actually sort of biased towards Bazel shouldn't, the Bazel output shouldn't depend on what's cached and what isn't cached. The, the history output from Bazel should be the same every time. And then you can change, you can then, I, you know, the conceptually, I think one thing that might be useful is that you can just filter uh, and change the filter to, to sort of select what you want to see in your history. Um, but that will only work if it, you know, right now, Bazel will only cache out, sorry, will only print outputs from uncached actions. But predicting which actions are going to be cached and are not for a normal user, for me, is impossible. Sorry, it's just, I don't know if it's going to be cached. I mean, Sometimes, of course, I know, like, I change this Java file, of course, I expect the compilation to rerun. Um, but there are a lot of cases where it's like, well, like deep in the tree, maybe it's going to be cached, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, there is, I, I've heard a lot of people say, no, it shouldn't replay the output of cached actions. But there is one specific group of users that really asked for Bazel to replay cached action outputs. And those people were, macOS developers. And the reason why they wanted it was that they really, really wanted to make sure to fix all the warnings in their C and C++ and Objective-C code. Because Apple makes something a warning and will make it an error on the next Xcode release. They have a very strong policy around that. And so as, as developers on these platforms, you really need to make sure that you go with the times because when the next Xcode release comes out, Apple will require that all the new binaries on the App Store, on the iOS Store, are built with the new Xcode release. And so if it has made something an error and you can't flip it back, you can't release until you fix it. And so especially this group of developers were very vocal about having a way to replay cached actions. So I implemented that and added a flag for that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't convince the rest of the team that we should always do this. Um, and the flag was actually removed a few releases ago. I'm very, very sad about this specific case. Um, all right, let's go back to history. So we get this history and we get this like giant pile of history. Maybe can we think about ways to limit the length of the history? Maybe we need to dynamically limit the length of the history. Maybe, you know, after we've printed like five error logs, like 10 megabyte error logs, maybe at that point we can stop printing error logs because you're not going to get any more interesting information out of that. Or maybe not, right? This is the, how do you as a user use it? I don't know. I know how I use it. And for me, it would probably be fine, but I would like to try it out and, and see if it works in my, in my daily workflow. I don't know ahead of time, right? This is, again, a scenario where you want to have flags 
for this kind of customization. And so that you can try it out before you commit to something. And then, of course, the, the tricky part is what should the default be? Again, the flags, the darn flags, what should the default be? Because some people maybe prefer this and some people prefer that. Um, the, the big problem in computer science is uh, deciding what the default should be. All right, let's, let's look at an example. Uh, this is like an error from a C compilation. Uh, there is some red up here. Then it prints the, the location of the build file. OK. It prints the name of the source file. It prints parts of the command line. It prints the target name. That's a lot of information. Um, in, in, this, in this formatting, we have one, two, three, four, five, six lines of like meta information about what this action is. Um, is that is that too much? Is that too little? Uh, you can actually change this if you use verbose failure flag. It will print more than one page of summary. Sorry, um, but sometimes this is really useful. And again, we come to that case where, oh, I need to debug this action. Sometimes you just need verbose failures, or sometimes you need the dash dash sub commands. If you haven't heard of that, it will print the complete command line. So you can actually copy paste that and rerun it in your terminal. It can be a lifesaver in the right circumstances. And then we get the output from the tool. So in this case, it was a Mac, uh, you know, Clang on a Mac. Um, and, and Clang will also like generate bold text, it will generate color output. All right, this is all part of the user experience. Now, one of the problems here is, well, there is a tool, there is Bazel, and they both print colored output. Is that going to fit together? Uh, are we going to have the same colors? Is, that, is there like a meaning to the colors? Right? As a user, if you look at the output, you see everything in your terminal. Um, and consistency, hmm, right? You, you're running a Java compiler, which has like this way of printing errors. You have a C++ compiler which does it this way. You have a JavaScript tool, which does it yet another way. There isn't really a, a standard for these kind of things. Uh, and one thing that, that was sort of talked about in the Bazel team for a while is maybe there should be a standard for tools to, to, to generate tool output and then for the build system to format it. Is that a good idea? Is that a good direction? Are we going to? be able to convince enough tool authors to provide support for this format, for this like machine readable format. Anyway, I, I think looking at this, this looks sort of reasonable, um, right? I can scan it. I can see what went wrong. I put text into the C file, which obviously didn't compile. Uh, so that's not too bad. There, the compiler actually, <laughs> The, the compiler output didn't fit on one page. I removed a part down here uh, because it was actually generating seven error messages, even though there's like only one line that doesn't compile. So, you know, different compilers again will behave differently in that case. Some compilers try to continue as much as possible, but maybe generating bogus error messages, and some compilers will just stop on the F of fail and just immediately just only one error message. Here is uh, an example of a warning. Um, now, again, this is sort of Bazel and the tool integrating with each other. Uh, for Bazel, what it looks like is there is some something was printed to standard error. But Bazel doesn't know what that is. Could be a warning, could be just a progress message, could be something else. Uh, so today, Bazel errors on the side of just dumping it. Um, and again, this is sort of a what, what is your preference question. Uh, there are flags to suppress output. There is a number of flags in the debug CLI category, which I highly recommend you look at, um, that allow you to control sort of what is output here. Um, what's a little bit weird is here is the inconsistency. There is info up here in green, and then the warning in, uh, I think it's red, um, 
Okay. Here are the flags, debug CLI, recommend looking at that. Uh, there is one flag to control streaming for, for tests specifically. There isn't any way to get streaming out of normal actions, but you can stream test output. So again, if you have that 10 minute running test, you can get the test log as, as they're written by the test. And then as soon as you see that it failed or that it passed or whatever, you have that feedback to yourself because you get it in a timely manner. Uh, you don't have to wait for the 10 minute action to, to, to complete. There are some pitfalls there. Um, so the, what about the test timeout, right? Normally, the test is sharded into four pieces, and we have a five-minute timeout on the test. Now we're running with test output streamed. Basil will not run the sharded anymore, but we'll run it as a single test. And then after five minutes, it, it cancels the test run because it thinks the timeout has elapsed. So once, if you use that flag, you may need to use other flags on top of that to increase the test timeout uh, so that the test will not just do that. All right, let's look at the current status. So what do we want from the current status? Here are some of my thoughts. And you may have different thoughts, and that's, and that's OK. We all may have different ideas of what we want here. Um, what I would like to see here is an indication of how long the build will take, right? If the build is going to take an hour, I may go have lunch. If it's going to take five seconds, I may just wait for it. Um, but right now, unfortunately, Basil hasn't... Uh, all right, we'll get to that. We'll get... I will have some examples of Basil output. Um, we would also like to see... Or I would like to see a summary of the results so far. Uh, how much work is done, how much work is still to do, right? The, the sort of the prediction of how long the build will take is sort of a little bit of that, but there are other dimensions that we might want to look at, right? I'm running 100 tests. Well, maybe the number of finished tests is actually a good metric to print. Um, have there been any build errors, right? When, when I look at the status, the history of the error may have long scrolled by. So maybe the status should show something went wrong, and maybe a summary of what went wrong. Um, and certain tests, again, is a special case um, where if, if tests have failed, then we want to know that. Um, we also want to, I, I think, we also want a summary of, of the ongoing work. Uh, but the question is what dimensions? Um, and there are many possible dimensions that we could summarize along. So this is the current basal test output. Here is a test command, not a build command. Um, I also enabled SkyMat. If you haven't ever heard about SkyMat, <laughs> it's a really cool new feature uh, in Basel 7 that um, is designed to make builds faster because by, by allowing Basel to do more stuff in parallel. Um, long story. There are flags for that. Unfortunately, it's not a single flag, so I put them together into a config here. Um, and then, so we have, in, in the SkyMail case, Sky, Basil is telling you sort of what is the analysis status, what build files have it, has it read, how many packages has it loaded, how many targets has it configured. Um, so that seems interesting, right? It's an indication of how much work it has done. It doesn't really tell us how much work is still to do. Um, then we have sort of a, a summary of the actions here in the front. These are the actions. Uh, what's a little bit weird here is that the second counter, the total, is also going up. Um, the reason is like complicated basal internals uh, that I hope will be fixed at some point. We have a summary of the tests. Here it says we have found 104 tests so far. Again, that number may go up over time. Uh, it tells us how many tests has, it has run. It, it also tells us uh, that tests have failed in this case. Um, and then it... And then, <laughs> Sorry, Basil wastes a giant amount of time, uh, of space on what actions are currently running, which I'm completely not interested in most of the time. Um, which seems a little bit backwards, um, right? Maybe it would be better for Basil to give you more information about loaded packages, configured targets, test results, and less information about how many actions are currently running, or like. The, the names of the actions that are running. I'm compiling XYZ. Okay, I, I guess. 
Now, there is a case where I'm interested in these actions, which is when they take particularly long, right? In many cases, and we've, I've, done, I've done some statistics on this, the average action is actually less than half a second, right? So if I print actions here, it's just gonna like noise, like every, every time it prints, it has a different set of actions for the most part. But some actions are long running, right? There are always like long running tests, long running compiles. Those might be really interesting to see here. So when we summarize, we might want to not just summarize along a specific dimension, we might want to summarize depending on context. We have these actions that take long. Okay, let's show the user that these actions are taking long. We have these really fast running actions. Let's just put one number there. I, I ran 10 actions in the last second, done. So then we look at sort of at the end of the build, we get a summary. Uh, and in the summary, I think what I'm interested in is uh, what, what works successfully. Um, but that part, maybe we can, we can summarize very densely. Right? I don't need a lot of information about how much work it has done, but you know some information, something that, that can give me a hint that I just wanted to build this tiny binary and it ran 10,000 actions. Hmm, that's interesting. Maybe I want to look into that. But sort of if it, maybe it can provide some of these hints. But certainly when we look at what didn't work, I want the summary, I think ideally to give me a fairly exhaustive list of what didn't work. Although again, you know, when we talk about 100,000 failing actions, don't print 100,000 failed actions. That's, that's, at this point, it's not useful. The, all of that information is in the history. So the summary can just maybe give a few examples and then say, yeah, 100,000 actions failed. That's good enough for me. But again, you know, someone else might want to have different, different things from the summary. Um, how long did it take? Uh, I, I often use basal builds and then look at the, at the sort of profiling information. Um, and so if basal could, in the summary, already give me like more of that information, then I don't have to go through a second or third step uh, where I then subsequently analyze, you know, other things from basal. Why can't it just analyze it and print it and it's a single step and then I'm done? But I mean, then I can focus on the important part, which is then to actually figure out, you know, why was it slow and do I want to change that and that sort of thing. So here's an example. Um, this is WISCIMAP. Uh, this is a little bit weird. I, we're getting some warnings that targets couldn't build and then there is some info in between and then other more warnings. Not sure what's going on there. Um, and then we have sort of the, the result of the analysis. Uh, some of the top level targets succeeded, some of them failed. Um, then it tells me that it found a bunch of things. Um, but it also tells me that there were loading phase errors, but it already told me that there are loading phase errors. So why is it telling me again? Right? And, and all of that really say, all of that screen space, you know, maybe we could use that more effectively. Right? Do I need to tell the user multiple times loading phase, loading phase, loading phase? Maybe not. Um, and then when we go to the test summary, um, it, it prints sort of a list of all the tests. This is interesting, but at the same time, what, what I've seen happen and what isn't, isn't uncommon is I, I run 100, 200 test targets and two of them fail. Then I get the two failures and they scroll off the screen because it shows all the past tests. And so that isn't maybe the most useful summary. Um, and again, there are flags, especially to, specifically for the test summary that allow you to control what information Basil is printing there. Uh, and one feature that I personally find very interesting is Basil cannot just show you target level information, but if you test generate test XML output files, Basil can actually show you test case information here in the summary. So you can see, well, like three test cases failed or five test cases failed rather than one test target failed. Um, right, which which again takes takes one of the steps. Right, I have a test target that failed. Okay, my next step is to look at the test log to see how many test cases failed, which test cases failed, and that's information that Basil could actually just automatically collect for me and, and just show me here, and I can skip a step in my workflow. 
And as I mentioned, there are some flags to control that. Now, so I, I got this. I got this Twitter message uh, where someone said, um, "Hey, everyone, good news! We're open sourcing a library to generate terminal output like Bazel does." And I'm like, uh, "Okay." So, what I also wanted to do in this talk is to show an example of maybe how we could do it differently. And I'm not trying to please everyone in this room, but just to provide some ideas of, of what it could look like. I don't just want to bash on Basil. I think Basil is actually doing a pretty good job on, well, not on the flag categories, but certainly on, on sort of the history output and the test summary. I think there are a lot of good things in there. Um, at the same time, I've, I've come up with this hypothetical. All right, so there is a history. I'm, I'm keeping the same model of like the history that scores away and then the current status. And so in the current status, I thought, you know, maybe we can use more space for everything that isn't running actions. Uh, so we have in SkyMail, we have the analysis which is happening at the same time as the build. Um, and so when we look at the status, you know, we, we are interested in where where is the analysis today? Sorry, right now in the build, right? We have some top level targets. There were some failures to load. We can give some examples of what failed to load. Uh, we have to summarize, of course. Um, this is again, this is just based on the information that Basil already prints, right? I didn't try to put in like a predictor of how long the build's gonna take because that, that is actually a hard problem. Although maybe AI can help us here. Um, um, then we have, then we have tests, right? This is a test command, um, right? Maybe the test shouldn't go here. Maybe it should go at the bottom. Actually, now that we're talking about it, um, right? Where we can show, right? This is a summary. This many tests we've got. Again, this is just information that we already have. But here, I'm also showing you an example or two, or depending on the available space for the status, there is actually a flag where you can tell Basil how many lines of status output it's allowed to use, right? And so it, it might be possible to use that to, to like dynamically control to some extent uh, how much summarization has to happen here, right? If I have a very large terminal, you know, maybe I have a big build and there are a lot of things going wrong. I want to rerun that and use a, a large sort of value for this for the for this current status, like a, a lar large number of, of, of lines that I allow Basil to really go all out and give me a lot of summary there. And then when we look at the, the executed actions, as I said earlier, you know, maybe we want to call out the one action that's been running for 100 seconds, but summarize the other stuff. And here's one way where, you know, when I talk about dimensions, Basil has action mnemonics, which sort of categorize the actions. And one, I've, I've actually implemented this at some point a few years ago. Um, and what's interesting here is you, you can now see sort of the relative size of your language books, right? Previously, you just saw the action scrolling by, but like, you know, no one can just like in their head count how many actions of each, each type there were. But if you summarize it like this, you can now see, oh, right now it's mostly doing Java compilation. And then it's changing and mostly doing C++ compilation. And then it's changing again and mostly doing JavaScript builds, things, whatever. Um, and that can tell you something about your build, um, right? In this case, it can tell you, oh, there, there is like a, a critical dependency, like a, a, a point, um, ah, what's it called? A bottleneck, thank you. A bottleneck through which all of these actions go. Um, and maybe we can, you know, because I now see that, I can fix that bottleneck, and then it runs the Java and C++ builds in parallel rather than sequentially, right? And that can, just that, I, I want to impress on you how much, how, how, how sometimes a tiny change can make such a big difference. We have seen cases where we made like a, a three-line change to a C++ file, and it made the build two times faster because that one C++ file was a bottleneck before and then it wasn't anymore. 
And so if we can do something like that, where the, the current status can give you some insight into your build while it's ongoing, you know, it can trigger some of these things. Now, you know, do you want that? Do you not want that? You know, some people want that, some, you know, maybe I will set the flags to summarize like this because I'm interested in seeing these bottlenecks. But someone who just, you know, wants to implement this one feature which has to be done tomorrow disables the flag because they're not interested. And I, that's completely okay, right? When we come, when it comes to UX, we will see cases where there are different use cases and different personas and different scenarios where different output is better. And I'm told to speed up. All right, all right. Let's give us. Let's look at the hypothetical summary. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm summarizing the build failures uh, in a sort of reverse order where I'm looking at what failed, and then these are the things I couldn't do because that failed, right? I said earlier, Bazel has a concept of top-level targets, so you select like 10 top-level targets, now you have a build file that doesn't load, and you have an action that doesn't, doesn't run because you know, it just fails, uh, and something else, you can, you can sort of look at this like a root cause analysis. And there is a particular one scenario where if you have a large repository, you make a change to a low-level library, seeing this root cause analysis can be really powerful because you know immediately, oh, this one error is where I need to fix it. Or not, right? Sometimes you make this one tiny change, everything breaks. But sometimes it's just this one thing. And certainly when we look at tests, um, maybe we should just not print the, the past test by default. Right, because in many cases, I just want to know that all my tests passed. I don't, I don't have to see all of the individual target phase. All right. Oh, and then down here, I added some more information. Like, well, this was, my, well, you know, what was my slowest action? And again, I often work with performance and improve performance and do performance things. And so having like the slowest action or the slowest target or something like that automatically give, you know, given to me by Bevel could be a game changer. All right, more questions. Is this the right model for it? Like, let's question everything, uh, right? We have the, the model of history and, and current status and summary. Is that the right model? Maybe we should do something else entirely. Maybe it shouldn't be a history. Maybe Bevel should actually have like a, an interactive, like, ASCII graphic output, and you can like click through a menu or something. Um, I don't think so, but it's certainly something to, to think about. Uh, what is the most commonly useful information to show for the status in the summary? I have ideas, but I'm just one person, and I have certain specific use cases that I go through every now and every, every, every you know, a lot. Um, what flags should Basil provide to adjust these things? What, what are the sort of the biggest group of personal preferences that Bezos should really support? All right. Whew. Yeah, uh, summary. Okay. There, I think there are a number of things we, that, that Bezos could do better. And uh, yeah, someone should work on it. That would be, that would be great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your patience. This was a very long talk. Whew.